Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another Knowledge Bomb episode of Lead to Greatness, where we believe in helping others reach their greatest potential, and together we can change the world. Today on Lead to Greatness, we have for the second time on Lead to Greatness, Dr. Christy Murray. Dr. Christy is an executive and leader in the oil and gas pipeline industry. She is the CEO and co-founder of Educational Excellence. She is an author and national speaker. Dr. Murray has over 27 years of expertise in electric engineering, education, business management, career and professional development, strategy communication, and much, much more. On today's podcast, Dr. Christy Murray discusses leadership fundamentals and development and how her leadership was shaping throughout her years of leadership. She defined and discussed what great leadership looks like and what you can learn from a great leader or a not so great leader. In other words, you can learn from anyone. Please help me welcome Dr. Christy Murray for the second time in self-excellence. This is Cedric Francis and you're listening to Lead to Greatness. First of all, thank you for inviting me back a second time. I am truly honored for the opportunity to come back and share. I'm Dr. Christy Murray. I am a 27 year professional who has a background in everything from electrical engineering to project management, uh, working in the oil and gas industry. I'm an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. Um, and I um, am a two-time author, a national speaker, and a professional troublemaker. I love a professional troublemaker. What do you mean by the professional troublemaker? <laughs> if you're not doing things that kind of shake things up or challenge the status quo, oh, yes. or you don't have the courage to speak up in times where um, it may be really warranted, then you have to question why you're in that space. So I'm, I'm someone who doesn't mind speaking up for what's right. I don't mind challenging myself and challenging others so that we can all, you know, show up different, show up better with some improved level of excellence. So that's the troublemaker part of it. I think iron sharpens iron. And if you are, and I I think I said it on the last podcast, but I say it frequently and I challenge myself and others. If you are the smartest person in the room that you're in, you're not being challenged and it's time to get a new room. It's okay to go back and make a grand appearance and a guest appearance in the past rooms or other rooms, but you have to be able to position yourself so that you are around people who are where you want to be or headed where you want to be so that they can challenge you and help you to grow. So absolutely. Right there. You just come (laughs) out the gate with knowledge bombs. Uh, during During the last interview, you talked about learning from great leaders and learning from not so great leaders. I want you to really dig into the to learn from the not so great leader. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to take it in two parts. First, you know, one of the common things that people always ask about is are leaders born or are they made? And what's your definition of leader? So as I even think about what makes somebody a effective or a good leader versus a not so good leader, I have to put it in the proper context. I believe that leaders are both born and made. And I believe that leadership isn't about position to me or title that you possess. It's really about an attitude and a mindset that you have and that you show up with. If you have the ability to get things done, working with other people, serving other people, and you can bring them along voluntarily without having to demand or force them to join that journey with you, those are some of the key fundamentals of what makes someone a at least a foundational leader. What makes you kind of advance beyond just being a foundational leader? There's a lot of other intangibles that I've witnessed, I've seen through other people. I'm learning to appreciate about myself more because I do think sometimes we we tend to look externally for leadership and we don't often think about those, the value that we bring in different aspects of our lives in terms of how we have to show up as leaders too. So when I think about what makes a leader a great leader, it has to be somebody who has the ability to first get to know themselves. You have to know who you are, what you are, what you are and what you're not, which means you have to be able to um, recognize those strengths you bring with you 
and those things that you may not do as well. I call them, you know, blind spots, you know, and you might need some help getting other people to help you along to understand what those things are about you that are holding you back. And so leadership really is about self-leadership first. You have to be able to take a step back and um, look at yourself. And, you know, we talked about emotional intelligence, but it's really about, are you self-aware? Are you aware of those things that make you really stand out and make you unique or those things that alienate other people from wanting to work with you again? And if you're a leader and you have to force people to join you, something's already off with that approach. And a lot of times we spend so much time pointing the finger at other people but we don't realize that we have to take a look at ourselves and do some self-reflection about what it is that may be turning people off from joining us. And I think the other key thing about self-leadership is it doesn't start on a job. It starts with your family. And whether you are the mother in a family or the father or the head or the support, everybody has a leadership role. In fact, I my kids grew up, I have two sons, they're now 21 and 18. But when they were young, I made sure that I helped them to recognize that you are empowered every day of your life to show up with some basic leadership skills. Mm. You get to decide what kind of attitude you want to have on a given day. You get to decide how you want to deal with difficult situations, even when people are not being kind to you. And so those are some of the fundamentals that we tend to overlook about ourselves. I also think that effective leaders know how to empower people. You have to give people permission or remind them of their power that they already have to show up as leaders in their own lives. And we don't do this nearly enough professionally. And you know, one of the roles that I play is I'm the director of stakeholder engagement at Rosen. And, and I'm in, still in the oil and gas industry where I've been for the last roughly 24 years or so. And you know, with that particular role and even roles that I've held in the past, one of the fundamentals that I've really learned to appreciate is you want to try to empower the people that work with you and work for you to see themselves as a leader, no matter what position they hold. So it doesn't become a, well, the leader should have told us this, or we were, you know, simply just following their direction, but by feeling more empowered and giving people permission to empower themselves, it gives them the ownership and accountability to decide how they show up as well. So those are just some of the high level takeaways. And I could talk all day about, you know, what makes a leader effective. Um, I'll tell you a quick example. When I first came into the oil and gas industry, um, I'm an electrical engineer. So I worked for an oil and gas transmission pipeline company in Houston, Texas, back in the late nineties, joined the organization. And I was put in charge of some pipeline construction related project work. And I'm going out um, to the uh, project site, um, lead the electrical engineer on the job, had contractors working with me and for me. And I get out there and I recognize that I'm showing up this little brown African-American female in an, in, an, in an industry that may not have been exposed to me in that sort of position before. Absolutely. And I noticed that I wasn't being heard. I wasn't being taken serious. Um, it was almost as if um, nobody, they, I felt kind of out of place in a situation where I needed to, and I was responsible for having a bit more control over what was happening. Um, particularly, you know, in, in the oil and gas industry, safety is paramount in everything you do. Absolutely. And so to me, that always weighed heavily in the back of my mind in any situation. Fast forward, so, you know, I spent a couple of days out in the field doing some field work. And when I came back to the office, I had a mentor. She was also an African-American female. And I go and I sit down in her office and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. This is my first time, you know, you know, I'm newly, you know, roughly newly out of school. I'm, I don't know how to handle this situation. I feel like, I feel like, I feel like, and she said, whoa, 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 whoa. Do me a favor. She said, I appreciate you sharing how you feel but I would encourage you to focus on what you can demonstrate, what you can prove, what is facts-based and what you can substantiate. Wow. And I sat back and I said, I don't know. So she said, you're not in an environment where your feelings are very well appreciated. I said, but what is appreciated? She said, what is appreciated is how you can demonstrate what it is you're standing behind. 
<laughs> and so that has been one of the most important um, differentiators in my professional career and personal career to where it's okay to feel. But what makes that so? What makes that true? It's the substantiating with evidence, with proof, with things that people can't dispute mm. is taking place yeah. that yeah. gives it, you know, ranch, wrenches it up another magnitude. And so that was one of those empowering moments for me to say, uh, stop whining, essentially. I'm saying having this conversation with myself, stop whining. Sure, you have feelings, but what's driving how you feel the way you feel? And what what makes that true about this situation? Focus on that piece. So I went back. I said, you know what? We got to change our own attitude. That's where self-leadership comes in again. And that's re really the premise for me in terms of what makes someone an effective leader. And I said, you know what? You've got to reshape how you show up in a situation so that if you're not getting the things that you need in terms of fundamental professional respect, that you change the narrative on that. And I know it was important to do that early on in my career. Went back out to the job site the second time. Kicked it off wholesale differently with a meeting. And I said, I appreciate everybody's, you know, opinions and, and, and perspectives and the hard work everybody's doing. But I think it's that we should normalize out this conversation. And I said, and from here on out, I want to remind everybody of what's at stake, who's ultimately responsible. And if there's a problem with any of those dynamics, feel free to leave now. I said, because one or two things are going to happen. Either you're going to stay or you're going to leave. But what I know to be true is I'll still be here. And in that moment, I don't know how they felt. I really didn't care. I, I, I just knew I felt better about myself. Um, and one of the things that I've learned um, along my journey, and I'm especially as I, you know, mature more and more, I don't want to say get older, but as I mature more and more, is that I have to be willing and have the courage to speak my own truth. And I think with leadership, we sometimes we can get into this people pleasing popularity contest kind of a mindset. Yeah. And you don't oftentimes sit back and be authentic with yourself and say, you know what, that is not going to make me feel good. I'm not going to sleep good or look myself in the mirror by doing these things. So how do I be true to myself, but also be respectful and show love to other people in the midst of those situations? So it was in that moment where I had to come to terms with you have a defining moment. Everybody has a defining moment or multiple defining moments where you have to decide what are you going to do next? Are you going to allow yourself to be disrespected, be disrespectful, to get walked all over? Or is there a way that you can speak your own truth and stand with courage and work towards the outcome looking different? Wow. I, I, I love this. And, and here it is. So you go out the second time. And you do something totally different. I mean, this is your first time doing this. So, I mean, it's got to be something like, okay, I'm going to come out with a different approach, but I don't even know how this is going to go. And then the results you got afterwards, how did that make you feel? It gave me more confidence in myself. Mm. It validated that I am who I think I am and I have the value and worth and I can stand on my own merit just as any other person out there in the field or in any room. And so that was incredibly um, empowering for me as a young professional at that time to recognize that I don't come with any nonsense. I don't do a lot of drama. I'm there to do an outstanding job. I am going to try to communicate effectively. I care about how people feel. But at the same time, I will not be disrespected. Oh. And that to me was kind of a confidence builder. And so I try to carry that forward with me in the work that I do even still. Yeah. That, 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 is, that is amazing because I had a family member married with children when he had to tell everybody in the household that this is my house. And it's like, man, you got to constantly remind everybody else and convince everybody else you don't have any control over your household. You, your influence, there's a problem. And I believe there's a lot of leaders do this. It's like they demand this, demand that, demand this, but they they never get that 
influence, that influence never kick in. Why do you think, why do you think that that's an issue with some people? Because some people know how to maneuver around like what you say you did. You maneuver, you, you made that pivoting point, you gained that influence versus somebody else want to demand. We have a listener like that. How can we help that individual? I think that's a great question. And when I think about influence and, and people who have to walk in and say, I am the best, I am the greatest. This is my house. I am your boss. And I've had people say that to me. I'm the supervisor. Um, I appreciate you saying that. We already knew that. Thanks Absolutely. though for adding that again. Absolutely. But here's what it really says. I am trying to force some legitimate power, mm. but I really don't have the influence mm. to bring you along on your own. So to me, it's a sign of um, poor preparedness and weakness, mm. because when you are prepared, you don't have to remind people of who you are. You only have to bring them along and work to gain influence. Employee I had who she was not a senior on my team and she struggled one day in my office because she, she didn't feel like she had power to make certain things happen. And I, as, I, as I reminded her, and I think it's important in this context, sometimes you don't need power. Sometimes you need influence. <laughs> and those effective leaders that you talked about earlier, they certainly know how to. They're very charismatic. They're transformative. You know when you know you're doing something really well, when you can get somebody to do something and they don't realize that you got them to do it. Yes. Now, if you're in a good relationship or marriage, it should happen naturally there too, where you have someone thinking it's their idea. You don't necessarily need the credit. You don't need to take it. But the end result is the end result. When it comes to influence, you're focused on what are we trying to accomplish? What are the outcomes? What are the results we want to see? Not necessarily putting yourself out there in front as if you're the only one, you're the only one who can and make it happen. Chances are, if you are in any leadership position or most of us can't get anything done without each other. I mean, we all have to have networks, resources, support groups, partnerships. And so to think that you are the begin all and end all, you're de only deceiving yourself. And again, like, like I said, I've heard people say, well, I'm the smartest person in the room. The smartest people in the room don't have to self-profess. I'm not an advocate of self-professing because to me, it weakens your argument because you've already distracted from your greatness on whatever level you self-proclaimed you had and now people are just sitting there questioning is i don't know about that i don't know if that is true yeah. and so the key the key takeaway is when you are able to influence people throughout my entire career i've been able to get things accomplished professionally um, even personally without having access to the decision without having access to the money without having access to the people to get it done and it's built off of respect, credibility, trust. And when you bring those things to the table and you do what you say you're going to do with some level of excellence and quality, you don't have to sell yourself. How you show up and your actions will sell it for you. Mm, that's a knowledge bomb. All your life, you know, and your whole life, you know, beyond corporate or whatever, your whole life, you've seen leadership that someone has influenced your life since you were born. How have these leaders shaped your perspective on leadership? Another good question. Um, tremendously. Um, my leadership, I would say I grew up with a, my mother who was a teenage mother, sisters at 16, me at 18, practically grew up together. And she, I watched, I'm an observer, I'm an introvert. We talked about that too. And what I do as I sit back and I watch, I spent my whole childhood sitting back and watching my mother. And I'm like, well, how does she do it? She still went on to graduate college with three kids at 18. How does she do it? We always had a roof over our head and you know food to eat. How does she do it? The bills always got paid. My mother had systems. She, if she did fall apart, she, I never knew it. <laughs> she found a way to make things happen without bringing us all down, I guess, like when, whenever she had peaks and valleys in terms of her mood and, and just things she was dealing with, the pressures that were on her, she found a way to shield us from them. And to me, when I think about fundamental leadership, you, uh, an effective leader, some of the ones I've had professionally who shielded their people from nonsense, 
who stepped out in front of, you know, the situations and protected their people in a sense, to me were extremely, I, they have much respect for me. Um, I also think that it's important that leaders take care of their people. I'll tell you a quick example um, of a not so great moment um, of leadership. Working a job, the only time in my entire professional career that I, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna begin with the end, that I actually received a disciplinary action. I wasn't fired, I wasn't suspended, but I received this letter of reprimand in my file. To me, it was crushing. If you know anything about my work ethic, my, my professionalism, just who I am as a person, you may as well have just banished me off the, you know, out of the United States just by getting that letter of reprimand. But here's why I sleep good every night and slept good then. I only received it out of an attempt to block an employee I had from losing her job. And so I'm not gonna get into the sordid details of it because it's really not important. What is important is going back to as a leader, you have to have the courage to do what's right, even if it's at a personal stake to you. And I knew that when I stepped into a situation where I had been circumvented and someone was trying to circumvent me to discipline one of my employees, and as I learned about that, I'm like, well, who does that? You usually bring in a direct supervisor. I quickly recognized that something wasn't right. And as I started asking more questions and bringing more facts situation and substantiating what literally happened, I knew that I was doing so at a personal risk to myself. Now, see, let me tell you something about a good leader. If you think you are a good leader, but you won't stand up for people or you won't put yourself out there and potentially put anything at stake or at risk, you probably got a little bit more homework to do on yourself. Absolutely. So I stepped in. She kept her job. She still has that job to this day. She has that job. We both received a letter of reprimand in our file, which was the lowest form of disciplinary action that could have been taken. And it was because I refused to just allow it to happen to this individual. So when I think about what has influenced me, people who stood up for what was right and you know had some level of integrity about who you are. And my integrity is not situational. It cannot be wavered based on who is in the room. I don't care if you're the CEO or the janitor, but it will not be wavered. It's going to be based on what I believe and what I know to be right. Now, I'll give you another example, and I'm going to switch gears and talk about the calmest person in the room. So I was working for this pipeline company, and we had some sort of pipeline incident happening at the time. And my boss, we were in this conference room, and we were all, it was kind of like a situation room where we were trying to sort out the problem and figure out what we were going to do next. And I remember my direct supervisor was sitting in the room like this the whole time. Now he spoke, well, maybe we should do this and I'll get my people to do that and we'll put a list together. You'll get on it right away. And everybody else is spazzing out. Oh my God, I don't know what we're gonna do, including me. <laughs> and I'm like, so after the meeting, we all went back to our offices and I circled back around to his. And I said, can I ask you one question? How in the world were you able to stay calm cool and collected in that situation. And he said, I wasn't on the inside. He said, you don't have to be calm. You just need to be the calmest person in the room. And I sat back and again, and I was like, oh, okay. So it's not that leaders don't freak out. They don't think, oh my God, how are we gonna make this happen? They don't get stressed. They don't feel the pressure surmount. They do, but they don't necessarily wear it written all over their faces. Because if you're doing that, when people look into you and they see you freaked out, it's only going to ramp up their level of anxiety. And so that's another key moment for me. And you know what? And so I, I watched him from then on out as my supervisor. And I learned a lot of great things about him. And he was calm. He was direct. He was honest. He was clear about what he wanted and what wasn't going to happen. He was respectful to his people. But you knew he did not play. And then I had a supervisor who, and he also gave clear direction, but I had another one who really had me frazzled. And this is what I learned I should not do. I'd been given like five or six projects and they were all, seemed like they were all time sensitive. So I knocked on this previous supervisor's desk one day 
And I said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, hey, I've got like six things on my plate and I think they all need to happen like yesterday. I said, can we do a little prioritization? You know, what comes first, second, third, you know, like how, how do you see this, you know, shaping up? Because I want to do them all and do them well, but I need some direction on that. And he said, all of them are priorities. And I had never been more demoralized as somebody who really wanted to do a good job, work hard, um, and, you know, support the organization. Then that moment, I walked out of his office feeling so deflated. And then I remembered, and I said, please never do that to anybody, Christy. And I said to myself, because when everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. And so those are <laughs> those moments oh, okay. where... Where you say, ah, you got me there, but I'm not going to do that to other people. And so I make it my personal mission. When somebody says, I need help deciding where I'm going to focus, it is your job to give them that level of support. Even if you help them to talk it through for themselves and come up with their own approach, but it is your job to coach them through those situations. Wow. That's another knowledge bomb. Chris, it's this moment. Okay. You said the leader was calm in the room. The meeting was over. You could have just went on by your merry way and not even thought about it or even asked him that question. What made you go back and ask him that question to get that lesson you got that's changed your life? What made me go back was this moment I, I couldn't let pass. And I said, I have just, I have to know. I was inquis inquisitive and I was curious. And I said, you know what? I could have gone home. It was close to the end of the day. And I said, you know what? My feet, my mind wanted to go one way. My feet went right into his office. And I said, I just have to know. What is it about this situation where it doesn't seem like you should have been that calm that you were? And, you know, one of the things that, it often reminds me of, and I'm doing this even today, is never letting a perfectly good crisis go to waste. Oh. It is in the midst of when things aren't going well that you have the propensity to learn the most about yourself and other people. And I always tell people, you learn the most about people doing weddings, That's funerals, not... weddings and funerals in particular, That's or not... sometimes divorce, because people are going to show up their best selves and their worst selves in those different life-changing situations. And so when whenever there is a crisis, I get quiet and I start observing people and I learn the most about who they are at their core. And so it was in my effort to be observant and say, huh, I have work to do on myself. I don't want to be the one always in an uproar. I have to have some self-regulation about myself. Going back to the self-leadership piece, everything that you hear me talk about, it always circles back around to me. And, you know, we talk about growing and developing and, you know, th that sort of thing. If you are a leader and you think you have arrived, you're already behind the curveball because you're, you're always in pursuit of self-excellence in my mind. Oh, maybe that's the name of my next book, In Pursuit of Self-Excellence. Mm. Now, I do all I've done all this talking Cedric about leadership and what I, you know, but please, I have to say this. I love to have fun. People who know me um, personally, and I don't typically let the whole world into this space, but they know that I can be goofy, silly, and have fun. I don't I make a conscious choice not to do anything that I can't have fun with at work, at home, anytime. So people say, well, what do you do for fun? You work all the time. But what they don't realize is I build fun into everything that I do. So I don't feel like I'm missing anything out by not going to a club or going to, you know, doing whatever those things that are just exclusively just fun. Now, I believe in self-care. You got to step away from the business and let your hair down and relax and rejuvenate. I wholesale believe in those things and having balance. But I would encourage everyone that when you wake up in the morning, that you find things that you can do to have fun or find a way to have fun in everything that you do. Knowledge bomb. Oh, man, <laughs> Dr. Christy. Wow. Where we go on today? I, I, I got to ask you this one question. If you could get it into a time machine and go back and talk to 20-year-old Christy, what leadership advice 
you would give her or what personal advice you would give? Um, I think the one thing that I would tell my 20 year old self is girl, uh, you're going to look this good at 40 and 50, <laughs> number one. So keep doing what you're doing, probably work out and, you know, eat a little bit better, but keep doing what you're doing. Now that's a joke. But one of the things that I would certainly tell myself would be to um, live my truth, do what I can live with, uh, wake up every day and make decisions and do those things that you can live with. Um, take care of myself, um, make sure that I deal and heal, deal with those traumas, bad, bad experiences or challenges in life that I haven't dealt with, but heal from them. Don't let them be all consuming. And don't let, don't wait until you get into your forties to start dealing with things that, you know, you might have experienced in your teens and twenties, deal with those things incrementally, learn how to speak your truth and be authentic and do it out of love. You know, one of the things that I I'm in love with myself about is I'm no longer willing to not speak my truth based on how other people might feel about it. And that means finding a way to speak my truth by showing love, making sure that I preserve people's integrity as I do it, but also preserving my own. But being able to say um, how you showed up in that situation was not okay with me. Now, here's the thing about when you speak your truth, just because you speak your truth, it doesn't mean it's gonna change how everybody else shows up. It changes how you respond to people and you owe it to yourself and other people to say, here's how I feel. I can't hold people responsible for what I haven't shared with you. But now that you know, I don't have the responsibility of holding on to those things anymore. And so I have learned to be able to say things out of love and care, but also giving people another choice. You, you can show up differently in some situations or not at all. And to be perfectly honest, it's very liberating when you're okay with either. Mm. Mm. So that is something that I have found to be very, very, very insightful about how I'm living my life. And, you know, all those things apply to leadership, too. Every last one of those things I just described. Wow, Dr. Christy, this is this this was amazing again. And I know the Lead to Greatness community, they're going to be excited. Dr. Christy, if someone wants to connect with you and what you're doing, where should they go? They should definitely reach out to me at c.murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, at educationalexcellenceinc.com. Or they can um, go and join my LinkedIn page at Dr. Christy Murray. Or they can actually join. And one of the things I do for the youth is I have a new group on Facebook and Instagram called Scholarships for Scholars. And that is my one place where I can commit and devote the time to help um, students and grad students and all find scholarships. So I'm getting a lot of traction there um, in that group as well. But those are three key ways. On behalf of the Lead to Greatness community, I want to thank you so very much again thank for taking you. time out of your busy schedule and adding value to us all. Thank you. Happy to join. Absolutely. And don't forget to subscribe to Lead to Greatness if this is your first time. And if this podcast was helpful to you, leave a big thumbs up. And also, I want you to check out our Marriage Coach Podcast, the podcast with my wife and I. If you're on iTunes, please rate this podcast and leave a review and help get the word out. Again, thank you, Lead to Greatness Nation, for joining us on today. Looking forward to seeing you again on next week. Till then, remember, if you help others reach their greatest potential, together we can change the world. Peace, we out.